you know, reproductive decisions of people in the community are very important. They have important consequences, not just for the individuals, but for other people too. This is the important thing. Like when you think about, uh, we tend, and, and this is one of the good things about the West, so it's kind of a paradox here, but we tend to be pretty utilitarian. Uh, I'm sorry, not utilitarian, uh, uh, individualistic about these things, or libertarian perhaps. So we think my reproductive decisions are mine. I get to decide. And how, why would you care about what I do? You shouldn't care about what I do in my bedroom. But here's the thing. What people do in their bedrooms affects everybody else. It affects everybody else in, in a variety of ways. Uh, one thing is, and I think we actually talked about this last time a little bit, but socially enforced monogamy actually decreases male-male competition by, in some ways, redistributing sexual resources, right? I mean, I know that's a crude way to put it, but it's true because what's happening is wealthier elites are not able to marry five women and thus take four other women out of the reproductive market, right? And so that's something where the, the, the reproductive system you have, it has important consequences for everybody in the system, and it has these consequences long down the road. Now, it is worth noting that, let's say, Gregory I and Augustine, not St. Augustine, but Augustine who went to uh, Christianize on missions to England, they weren't thinking, you know what, this will have these awesome consequences 800 years from now. They didn't know that. They didn't understand that. They did think about what it would do immediately to prohibit certain forms of marriage, etc. But some of these consequences are happy accidents, if you will, right? It, just, so it turns out that when you prohibit these kinds of marriages, you get different kinds of economic systems, you get different kinds of legal systems, etc. But the, the polygyny one, I think that's something to think about. And, and the way that prohibiting polygyny, it doesn't just affect sexual behavior. It affects a lot of social behavior. And just to think about minimizing male-male competition. Why is that important? Because one of the things that's incredibly difficult about creating a large society is that males will kill each other. <laughs> males compete for resources, including sexual resources, and the males who are the losers will lash out and violently interact with other males and try to take their resources. So all, all of these various mechanisms we have for reducing male-male competition, especially violent competition and sort of channeling it in a productive direction, those mechanisms are really important. And one of the mechanisms is socially enforced monogamy. Yeah, uh, I was. I have, I have a lot to say, so let me get through it. The first one is, is when people were doing missions to convert people to Christianity, uh, I think in their mind, they really were thinking long-term. They were thinking civilizationally. I wasn't there. I can't inject. I'm just speculating <laughs> here. But like it, wow. it there, there, it wasn't arbitrary. It wasn't. Well, I agree with that. I it wasn't. That, yeah. uh, what's the word? Capricious. It was. It was. It was. Yes. It was calculated, and they did want to have a positive outcome. It wasn't to make people miserable. It wasn't to hurt mm -hmm. them. It was to say, "This is the best way to form a society and a civilization. So let's enforce these norms, and let's have marriage between be between one man, one woman, and each man gets one woman, and you guys have a family, and you raise your kids, and we pass on wealth, and we pass on information and culture and norms and values and everything." And this way and we don't have a giant reserved army of of uh, of mateless men who uh, are killing each other and stealing things and playing video games and jerking off the porn all day in 300 ad right so yeah, i was gonna say the technology was a little different from what i've read in books <laughs> right exactly right so uh then then i'm also th I'm also thinking about how um the the sex practices um uh today versus people's perception of the vaccine today for example you will hear the same i think type of person making the argument that it's really important for me to have my own sexuality and to not be judged by other people and to be open relationships and maybe this or have a child over here if i want also all of you better get the fucking vaccine to protect me and to protect grandma 
it's very interesting that though the Venn diagram overlap of sexually liberated people in this regard mm. who are mm -hmm. also interested in you getting the vaccine to protect me, which I think right. if the Venn diagram overlap, you might have your traditionalists over here who like the merit monogamy and one man, one woman who are also like the vaccine protects me. And if you want to get it fine, I'll make my own choice. I think this is a pointing out a little bit of the hypocrisy around the vaccine, or at least a misunderstanding of the mechanisms at this point, but it sure, is, but it, go ahead. Interjection. Couldn't you say that I, I get your point. I think it's a good, it's an interesting point that people have this, we've developed this hyper autonomy about sexual behavior. But then we, a lot of people are hypocritical and they don't have the same feeling about the vaccine. So like the vaccine autonomy argument would be, look, that's putting something into my body and I'm incredibly uh, uh, fastidious about what goes into my body. And then they would say, well, that affects everybody else. But they don't say the same thing about right. sexual behavior, even though it does affect everybody else. So, so you, I, I think that's a an interesting point. Um, I don't have strong views about vaccine mandates. I am va triple vaxxed and I'm happy to be, but <laughs> doesn't the hypocrisy also possibly go the other way? And that is to say, if you're a traditionalist and you say, you know what, like your sexual behavior affects other people, couldn't you then say also your decision to be vaxxed maybe affects other people and and that gets it, into a complicated debate does. which it, i don't have strong opinions about but i get your point which is we have different zones of autonomy that we've carved out and one thing you're pointing to is progressives have this very strong autonomy idea about sexual behavior that perhaps is inconsistent with reality i think there that's what i'm getting at and it okay. it, re it reminds me of of the the debate between liberty and licentiousness. And it also reminds me of Benjamin Franklin or whoever it was it may not even been in him, but saying like your Liberty extends, you know, as far as the tip of my nose. Now, what's interesting is where is the tip of everybody's nose, <laughs> right? You, you pointed out very clearly. And, and I have had some change in, in heart about this stuff over time. I agree with your assertion that individual sexual practices have an impact on other people that aren't even your mate. It has an right. impact on your neighbor. It has an impact on the person in the Capitol. It has an impact on military that we have to send to go do things. I mean, it is, it has an impact. So, and, and I can see why the Christian value of chastity makes good sense because there are spillover effects from sexual behavior that aren't limited mm -hmm. to the person you're having sex with or didn't have sex yes. with, but random people in your same community. And one of the way things that we can point to with that is in households that do not have fathers present where the woman made a choice somehow that resulted in a single family or single mother household. The stats are very clear that there is a relationship between that and crime relationship between that and welfare dependency relationship between that and quality of life in the community, <coughs> excuse me. And so there was a point in my libertarian shameful past where, <laughs> where I really believed that your independent decision-making and who you chose to have sex with and how the manner in which you chose to conduct your sexual behavior didn't have a societal impact. But I do mm -hmm. understand now that it does. And it's very clear that right now we're living in a soft polygynous society where a small group of men, the Tinder stats bear this out, the OkCupid okay stats bear this out. Anecdotally, it is borne out. And in my personal practice, it is borne out again, in my past, that there are a, there's a small group of men who are at least serially, if not concurrently, occupying multiple mating partners at the same time to the detriment and exclusion of the vast majority of all the other men in society. And this is perhaps directly related to the breakdown in socially enforced monogamy the advent of no fault divorce and all kinds of other things that have led to a decision-making that deviates from like 
household formation and chast and chastity is the best way for you and for society. And I don't know how the hell we got here, but this is <laughs> this is an interesting. We, point well, to bring we were up. talking about the the family marriage program mm. of the Catholic Church, and, and I everything you've said, I agree with. It's what I wrestle with and, and the sort of dialectic that I have, that I, uh, that I experience that's somewhat disconcerting because I don't have a, a, it's like a dynamic. I don't have an equilibrium here is that I both love classical liberalism and the idea of like individualism and maximum autonomy, but also recognize the problem with that philosophy and the fact that, in fact, liberty has to be disciplined and ordered. <laughs> and I don't know, you know, I can, on one day, I, I feel a little more sympathetic to Catholic views. On another day, I feel a little more sympathetic to Thomas Jefferson's views, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's a dynamic tension. But I, I think it's important, and I wish more people would simply just you know, simply recognize this, that this is a real challenge and that there are externalities to any mating decision. And I do worry about, it hasn't happened yet. And I, I'd have to look at statistics and we could look at them to see what exactly what's going on. But there are more people who seem to want to mainstream polygyny at least to be able to say, I'm polygynous, I'm going to take multiple partners to this gathering and everybody should respect that. I'm pretty, I'm reluctant to do that. I, I think that's a bad idea. I think it's, it's a bad idea for the reasons we've been talking about. And, and I think it inevitably will end up benefiting uh, a subset of elite men at the expense of women and other men. And, and I don't, therefore I I'm concerned about that. It, I, it disconcerts I, I, me. I am concerned about that as well. I can confirm in practice in reality, this is really happening and it is something that needs to be on people's radar for uh, what's hap going to happen in the next five to 10 years as these start to play out over time. Uh, when we start to get people in their late thirties, early forties, early fifties who have experienced this type of mating market and have come out on the other end with no, with no mate. 